about that. Let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the conventional ways of getting things done. The conventional manner of doing it, and, and to some extent we've, we've painted this as a, as a house of cards. I don't know if you all have ever made houses of cards, but if you, if you undermine one of these, these underlying layers of the hierarchy, and the hierarchy is built on the idea of manufacturers and suppliers being at the base of all this, they're supplying to subcontractors, the subcontractors are answering to general contractors who are then in contract with owners and architects and so on and so forth. And if one of those base layers begins to fall apart, then the, the finger pointing starts and oftentimes it leads to frustration for the rest of the people because of the ripple effects through the course of the project. That happens on a lot of projects, a lot of time, especially nowadays. Uh, there's a lot of instability in the marketplace and so contracts that people were, were dead set on, even in good times that happens. In 2004 when the price of steel, I don't know, you know, those of you that are in the construction and design industry in 2004, the steel guys were calling us up and just saying, I know I got a contract with you, I can't honor it. If I, do, if I honor my contracts, I'm gone. I can't honor it. I'm just telling you that I, I need to negotiate new terms of a contract with you. And that was in the best of times. But when China came in and bought up all the steel in the, st in the uh, United States, all the scrap steel, the prices shot up to triple what they were before, and suddenly everybody was stuck. But in the worst of times, too, it's not unusual for, in public procured work nowadays, for a publicly procured project to go out to bid and have in the old days, there might be seven or eight general contractors going after it. Nowadays, you'll have 40 or 50 general contractors going out after it. And they're assembling teams of subcontractors that are, that are wide and far. And they're all cross-fertilizing with all the other sub general contractors. You may have several thousand organizations providing bids. And you end up with a bid that's representative of those that have made the biggest mistake. That's the reality of it. You're nodding your head. You've been there. <laughs> that is the truth. That's the way it is. And then you as a general contractor are asked to take the risk on that. And so you've got decisions to make. And that's, that's the way the, the nature of the game is. This little illustration leads to oftentimes what happens. If, if you can read the text on here, the giant yacht is called change order. The little dinghy is called original contract. <laughs> and, and so, so they, they get the job on the basis of this low bid scenario where cost is driven down and then they are without profit. They are without money to do the job. And of course, at that point, they have to exploit every opportunity that they can. The code official comes onto the job site and says, I want this instead of that. We discover something unforeseen on the, on the situation, especially in remodel projects that we didn't know that was going to be this complicated or wasn't covered well enough by the architect. Or the architect makes a dumb mistake and doesn't put enough information, omits something that should have been in the drawings that wasn't in there, doesn't clarify something well enough doesn't describe what the owner's intent was, or simply makes a mistake. And at that point, you're wide open to the whole change order game. And at that point, they're making up for lost ground trying to bring the course of the project up. And so in, the, in that regard, oftentimes, the architect is asked to play the role of the defender of the documents. And in any regard, I am. I'm, I'm there. I'm, I'm entrusted by law. I am legally required, first and foremost, to serve the health, safety, welfare of the general public, not the client, the general public. That's my, that's my license in every state. That's what it says. And then beyond that, we start to serve the needs of, of the client. But sometimes that role transfers, as I said earlier, into the role of a pit bull. I'm there to enforce in, in that kind of a manner. And so it can be very frustrating. It's very sequential. You hire an architect. The architect comes in and designs the project. And then at some point along the line, you begin to expose that project to a, a group of general contractors. The general contractors begin to look at it where the engineers begin to look at it first and then the general contractors begin to look at it, but all the way along the line you're adding these pieces and components as, as time goes on. Very sequential. You're really relying on the, the general opinion of the architect on the direction of the project in the very beginning, sort of that sole trusted advisor. And you know, when I got involved in architecture 30 years ago, you know, the, the sort of solid trusted advisor architect role was firmly implanted, but as time has gone on, that's become very fuzzy. General contractors have figured out that sometimes the architects are not very good trusted advisors. They, they've got the, the, the owner down the path on, of no return on cost uh, for whatever reason. Either they weren't attentive to it or they didn't understand it or whatever the situation was, and they've been able to come in and say, we can find a better way to do this. So the sequential process of design, bid, build has been supplanted in some regards by other concepts. So the two dominant forms of contracting in today's world are design, bid, build. You as a, as a owner go out and you hire an architect, you interview architects, you hire one, he produces the drawings, you put it out to bid, you accept the bids, the architect goes out and helps, assists 
build that get that building built along with the general contractor. The other way to do it is, and, and oftentimes I'll, I'll I'll tell you some of the downsides of that is. Owners sometimes in those situations see the conflict that happens. The warring architect and the contractor who are butting heads, maybe raising their voices. A lot of that, that uh, job site trailer kind of conversation goes on. And in, in most regards, the owner ends up becoming the mediator. The owner has to be the one that's sitting in the, in the midst of that conversation trying to weigh, is this an architect trying to defend an indefensible position? Or is this a general contractor who's being exploitive and going after things? Or is it a combination of both? And so the, the owner in that regard oftentimes ends up becoming a mediator in a situation they don't really know. They don't really understand it, especially with churches. You send the associate pastor in to be the guy that handles the project. Poor Ken is sitting there and he's going, I got this dumbbell architect who's in here you know, making stupid decisions on his drawings and I've got a contractor who's going for it for a price. And you have to discern, okay, well, what's right here and what's not right here? And it's uncomfortable, and it's uncomfortable for churches for a lot of reasons. Churches aren't very good at handling conflict. Church people aren't very good at handling conflict. And, and they sit in these meetings, and all of a sudden there's a couple of people screaming at one another, trying to enforce their points, and they're trying to figure out what's going on here. It's not a good situation. It happens all the time on projects everywhere. That's just the course of it. And those that have been in construction know it's just sort of the rules of the game. Construction and architecture oftentimes form conflict. And as I told you before, Architects find themselves in these stupid conversations. We don't know all there is to know about construction. But I'm, I'm going to admit that to the last person on earth is the general contractor I'm not going to tell that to. You know, and he's trying to subtly sort of gather some lost profit, and so it, it becomes a real source of friction. So sometime in, in the uh, 90s, uh, a form of contract sort of reemerged that I think was much more predominant in older times, maybe more in times when people trusted one another a little bit more, and that was design-build, where the architect and the contractor, sometimes in the old days, were the same. They were the master builder, or in today's version, the contractor goes out and finds an architect in the marketplace, and they pair up, and they form a buddy system. They form a single contract. That's called design-build. Architects sometimes call that the fox in the hen house. Suddenly, the architect loses his voice because in a design-build relationship, the architect does not work for the owner. The architect works for the at-risk partner in the relationship, and the at-risk partner in the relationship is the general contractor. The general contractor is the one guaranteeing the price. They're the ones whose neck is on the line. They're the ones calling the shots, and the architect is there to, first of all, ensure the health, safety, welfare of the public, but to second, to support his partner, his relationship, and in some regard, acts as a subcontractor to the general while he's pretending to act as the agent of the owner. Okay? Don't mistake it, though. Oftentimes, at the end of a design-build relationship, owners will say, yeah, we didn't have any arguing. It was great. We didn't have any arguing. But somewhere along the line, I sort of thought I lost my voice. All of a sudden, decisions were getting made that I don't, not to this day, know were in my, my best interest. It may have been in the best interest of the general contractor. It may have been in the best interest of the architect. I don't think they were in the best interest of us, or were they? There's the out. And I've had those situations. I was sitting out in the hallway a few minutes ago with Dean, and I was, I was saying a few years ago I was doing a stadium project, and Jim Harris walked into the, to the uh, job trailer uh, with myself and the general contractor, and we sat down at the table, and Jim says, I want all the sheetrock work up on level 7 of this skybox edition at the stadium torn out. And this is like a month before it opens. And, I said, well, what's the problem? And he said, it's just terrible. I don't know what these guys were drinking before they went up there to put that sheetrock on, but it's wavy. It's all over the place. And he was right. It was bad. You know, but at that point, I feel the general contractor tapping me under the table with his leg, his foot on my leg. And what he's telling me is, be careful. You don't work for him. You work for me. And he's right. I work for him. So my answer had to be tempered based on what was right for the general contractor, not necessarily what's right for the owner. But those are the two methods, design, bid, build, design, build. Those are the two ways of getting projects done, and you can sort of pick your poison. Uh, which one is the best one? Do we want to the, the drive the cost down to the very lowest price and go to battle, or do we want to avoid the battles and have these, these groups team up? In church design, too, ubiquitous throughout the nation are these design-build companies who are very self-serving. There's all kinds of these groups out there that I see them at conference events that have been doing it for years. Some of them good, some of them not so good, some of them great, some of them not so great. 
but a lot of these guys are very much profit driven and you've got to be very careful because it is the fox in the hen, hen house and so I'm a strong believer as an architect that you need an architect as a trusted advisor but I will admit to you that there is value to you to have the general contractor also be that equally weighted trusted advisor as long as I'm not subservient to the general contractor. So that's the kind of relationship we want to talk about. Oftentimes in these relationships, when they're set up this way, these walls get divided. These are supposed to be brick walls that are standing between there. It's hard to see those bricks, but, but oftentimes the, the lines of communication are not very direct. And so a team of subcontractors underneath a, team, a general contractor, they may have questions. Sometimes they don't let those questions out because they use those questions as fodder for cost escalation later on. But if they do have a question that they need to get out, they have to go through the general contractor who goes back through the owner to the architect down to the engineer or to the source of the answering the question. And so sometimes the lines of communication are not very direct. And for that reason, there's not a lot of information exchanged during the course of a bid based on a project except for what's on the drawings and in the specifications and a few questions. But uh, the, the common thing is, is after the project begins and the change order flow starts to, to begin, is the architect will say, well, why didn't you bring that up during the bid phase? Well, I didn't see it during the bid phase, but if they did see it, they're not going to say anything about it anyway because it becomes a source of, of profit during the course of the project. So we want to avoid all that. We find value in having a general contractor present earlier in the process. That is important to owners. If for nothing else is it keeps architects, and I'm one of them, it keeps them in check. It helps us be accountable to one another. There is value to having two knowledgeable individuals who look at it from two different perspectives, design perspective and constructability perspective, present at the table from the get-go on the project. Owners will receive value from that. That's a good thing for you to have. So that's what we're, we're in support of, but we're not going to do it under a single contract. We want to we propose that it's a better thing to do to keep those contracts separate. We, we want you to think of it in this way. Think of the contractor and the architect and the owner are going to work on the pinpoints of this triangle, and they're going to agree to put God in the center of that relationship. We will agree as a team that this project is not about the honor and glory of the architect. It's not about the honor and glory of the of the owner and the owner's team. It's not about the profitability of the general contractor. It's about keeping each other healthy through the course of the project, not driving each other into the ground, but putting God in the center of that relationship. We're going to act like Christians with one another. And if we act like Christians with one another, we have a greater chance of, of success, and we have a greater chance of others seeing that relationship in a positive light. And frankly, that's how Christianity spreads. That's the way it happens. 